Today on Extreme 4x4, Jesse and Ian are wired up as they hop back on Project Poison Spider. Plus, see how these mud freaks turn their boggers into submarines with a little homemade ingenuity. Welcome to Extreme 4x4, another one of our Poison Spider builds. You can see we made a lot of headway on this tube buggy since the last time you saw it. Yep, as soon as all the fabrication was done, we stripped her down, put her on the trailer, and took her to the paint shop. And to our friend John Bohannon at Bohannon's Concepts. Once we got the Bruiser 8 inside, Hutch, our right-hand man, helped me prep the buggy, which would have taken me forever to do it by myself. Goodbye, cruel world. Goodbye. Next came a couple coats of red primer, followed by three coats of PPG's Viper Red single stage paint. It was nice of Hutch to give you a hand prepping this chassis. Yeah, he's a trooper. And with it back in the shop and in finished paint, we can start to bolt it back together. And we're gonna start with a disc brake conversion on this rear Dana 60. The Dana 60 rear drum is not only massive and heavy, this thing can pack full of dirt, water, and mud, making it absolutely useless as a braking system. So we're going to convert the rear axle to disc using this bracket kit we got from Blue Torch Fab. Now this is going to bolt up in place of the stock backing plate, and then we can go ahead and install the rotor and the caliper. This kit uses a 1980 GMC three-quarter ton front rotor and loaded caliper. Tighten the caliper bracket bolt, making sure the bleeder screw faces up. To stick with our red and black theme, I'm going to go ahead and two-tone the dash. But before I can do that, we've got to lay out all our gauges and our switch panel. Now, because this is a custom rock rod, we went ahead and chose a universal wiring kit and switch panel system from Painless Performance. Not only does this kit come with all of the switches that we're going to need, but it also comes with circuit breakers. So if we get a short out on the trail, all we have to do is find the problem, reset the circuit breaker, instead of carrying a bunch of fuses with us. After marking the location for the panel and gauges, we can cut it out with the body saw and mount it in place. With the hole cut out for our switch panel, I can move on to our gauges. These are our sport comp gauges that we got from Autometer. They all have that brushed aluminum look, so it's going to complement this panel. The whole dash is going to look primo. Now, being the fact that we don't have a very big dash, we also had Autometer send us these roll bar mounts. So they'll just hug the bar like this, and then the pot will go on just like that, so you can hold on to the little ones, and you can put them anywhere. Anywhere you want. It's all your choice. The last piece to go on this rear axle is going to be a new indestructible diff cover. Well, we got ours from Crane High Clearance. That's a chrome molly alloy cover, and it's a lipless design. So when you install it, you're just going to set it on the axle housing, line it up, and check to make sure that the cover isn't overhanging on the bottom side of the diff. If it does, you just grind a bit of that cover away, and then it won't get hung up on any obstacles or rocks. Now, Crane also raises the diff fill plug up on the cover, so if you tilt your axle to compensate for pinion angles, you'll still have enough fluid in there for your gear set. Now, the brakes on the front axle are a little bit different. If you remember, we had Dynatrack put together one of their unit bearing elimination kits and then modify it to fit this Crane link pin spindle. But we're going to change it even more. Normally, this thing would have the rotor pressed on from the back side, just like the rear axle. But we're going to have this machined to accept a 2004 Dodge hat style rotor. This rotor is bigger and it's going to give us more braking power. But the biggest benefit is we're going to be able to use a two piston caliper in the front. Now, we got this one out of a junkyard used for mock up. And I've marked the center line of our new rotor on this axle. And I just have to build a bracket to fit this. Now, the biggest benefit for us doing this is if we ever want to upgrade later to a set of aftermarket big brakes for this axle, we just have to remember that everything fits a 2004 Dodge. 
measure for the bracket, set the caliper in place, and mark the two center lines. Using some cardboard, we'll make a mock-up and then transfer it to quarter-inch plate and cut it out. During the break, Jesse will finish prepping the dash, but up next, these extreme mutters show us how they keep their rigs running underwater. We know that a lot of you guys are into Jeeps, a lot of you are into desert racing, a lot of you into rock crawling, but you gotta admit, mud racers, or a breed of their own. And on our last trip to Smoke Run, Pennsylvania, we learned the secret to surviving underwater includes silicone, duct tape, and coffee cans. <laughs> Mud racing's a dirty business, and if you don't protect your engine, it can be costly. Motors don't like water. You'll know today when if one gets water, it'll start backfiring and carrying on. You'll hear it. Once you get water in your engine, it's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars to fix it. It's over. I mean, you have a boat anchor. With three extreme mud holes, Muddy Run Raceway puts these men and their machines through the ultimate waterproofing test. Nothing like it in the world. I mean, I did a lot of back water and back in the mountains and stuff when I was younger, but not like this. You didn't have to waterproof them when you were just going out in the woods. But this is intense here. Yeah. In the pits, the consensus is do what it takes with whatever will do it. Waterproofing the distributor. <laughs> is that what duct tape was made for? I yep. guess. Everybody has their own ideas on waterproofing. 90% of it works. Yep, plastic grocery bags inner tubes, whatever you can get your hands on. You got the silicone and everything around the carburetor. We, you see there's blue grease on there. That's hard grease, grease deferred water. It's around the distributor. You also put caulking around your cap of your distributor. We grease the boots on the spark plugs and onto the distributor to keep the water away. You have to waterproof incredibly. I mean, just tape everything, duct tape, probably at least a roll of duct tape underneath the hood to waterproof everything and silicone and just grease. Anything you can imagine to stop the water. Even a coffee can can make the difference. We come up with to stop the water from going into the intake. You know, two coffee cans TIG welded together and that snout you see on it, it's uh, off of a lawnmower bagger and run into the inside of the vehicle to keep the water and mud from going in there. You get any water down the carburetor, you're down. Competing were big blocks and small blocks, full size and not so full size. There's also a willy. Something different. You know, you don't see them every day. This is a 52 Willys wagon on a 77 Jeep frame. It's been built by blood, sweat, and beers because you drink beers and you bleed when you're working on it all the time. I've had that on all my trucks because it's true. It's all Jeep. There's any modifications is the motor. The motor and the rest of it's all strictly Jeep. It's a 401 Jeep engine in it. It's doing about 400 horsepower. The motor performs pretty good. It competes. I'm, I'm well pleased with it. With the slop that is mud racing, he decided to move the radiator. I moved the radiator in the back because it stays cooler back here because it can get in the air. And when I'm running my fan, it it makes the motor, the water's got to travel further and it keeps it cooler. Works real well. Chuck knows waterproofing the engine is the key to success, but getting it right has been the hard part. It takes a long time. It took me four or five years. I come out here, I'm sitting in there in the water hole getting pulled out, you know? But it really makes it feel good when you make it the whole way around that track without it watering out or breaking up or anything and it's running good. Generally go out there and give it all we have, you know? What's nice if you can bring it back and load it on that trailer, you had a good day. I like the name of that whale, he's blood, sweat, and beers. Just like a Canadian hero, Red Green often says, duct tape is a man's best friend. We'll be right back. <laughs>
Got a show idea for Ian and Jesse? Email them at Extreme4x4TV.com. Welcome back to Extreme 4x4 and our Poison Spider Bruiser 8 buildup. Now that we got the gauges and the switch panel in, we can begin to plan out our wiring harness. Now wiring a tube buggy is a little different than just replacing a harness in a stock vehicle. And because of the serious conditions that a harness can see, you got to plan it a little bit differently. And when you're planning out a harness, the first thing that you're going to have to do for anything is determine how many circuits you're going to need. So we just simply made a list because we're going to need circuits for our off-road lights, our cooling fan, our fuel pump, our tail lights, our power supply to the gauges in the switch panel. Anything else? We probably need a power feed for our engine harness, which we'll use to control this all-aluminum LS1 small block that we got from GM Performance Parts. Now, if you remember, we made it that engine to a 4L65E computer-controlled transmission. But the nice thing is, is this ECU and harness kit that we got with that package will control both the engine and the transmission at the same time. Now, there's a lot of wires to hook up and things to mount, but everything can only be plugged into one spot. For the items that we're going to be sending power to, we need to figure out what type of circuit each item needs. Some of them are going to use a relay, and others are going to use a simple circuit. Our rock lights, for example, are LED units, which draw very little current, so we can just control them through a switch. But our electric fan, our fuel pump, our off-road lights draw a lot of amps, so we're going to have to run them through a relay. And a relay is simply an electrically controlled switch that gets its power from a separate 12-volt source. So when I flip the switch to the cooling fan, the power goes through the relay, which activates an internal switch, pulls the power from the source and goes straight to the fan, which eliminates the fact that we might burn out our switch. To keep things a little bit more organized when we start to lay out that harness on the floor, I'm just going to take some rough measurements of where we want the main harness to run through this tube chassis. This is going to make things a lot easier when it actually comes to pulling wires through this mess of tubing. We're not going to have a bunch of wires in a rat's nest trying to figure out which way they go. We'll be able to bundle them together and actually make a main harness. A good starting point for any wiring harness is a floor layout. With the measurements that Ian took, we can go ahead and start doing that right now. Thanks. This is also a good time to actually draw an official wiring schematic for your harness. And that way, if you have any problems in the future, it makes it easier to diagnose. We never know what kind of elements our bruiser is going to see. So when we talked to Painless Performance and told them about our project, they had suggested the Off-Road 6 kit because it comes with these waterproof switch boots and this waterproof fuse panel. So it's going to go ahead and keep all of our electrical stuff dry. We are going to use a spliced main power feed for each switch. Once the main power wire is in the box, we tap into it for constant power for the off-road lights and cooling fan. Now that all the wires are run, I will start to bundle them together into a harness. I have completed the schematic of the entire system, and by following it, I can easily see that we are not going to have any major problems. The most common problems when building your own harness are unfinished circuits, unprotected circuits that don't have a fuse or a circuit breaker, or a bad ground. Now, when you come up with a wiring schematic, the best thing to do is just think of it like plumbing. The electricity's got to flow through a circuit breaker or a fuse that will act as an automatic shutoff if something's wrong. It'll have to go through a switch to control whatever you need to control, and that's like a manual shutoff. And then it has to travel all the way to the device that you need to power. And then once it reaches that device, it needs to go to ground to return back to the battery. Now you can do that through a ground wire right back to the negative post of the battery, or you can use a common ground. And that's just screwing it to the chassis, and then it'll use the metal in the chassis or the vehicle's frame to go all the way back to the battery. There's a circuit that people have a lot of problems with, and that would be your headlights and your taillights, or your brake lights and your blinkers. I'm sure you've seen it when the guy's driving down the road, hits his brakes, and his front turn signals come on. But there's a way to prevent that, and that's by using a diode. What happens is when you put the power to the switch, you're going to have current to your headlights, but it's also going to go through the diode and out to your taillights. You flip the switch the other way, you're going to have power out to your taillights, but the diode's going to stop it. So, if you put a diode at your brake lights, your blinkers won't come on when you hit the brakes. So for that guy driving the 32 Ford in my neighborhood, go and buy yourself some diodes. 
With the switch panel installed in the dash, we just have to run the harness throughout the entire chassis. And we're gonna protect it by using the split braided sleeving that we also got from Painless. And then all we have to do is hook up the battery and all the lights, it's good to go. Having fun. They work. <laughs>to Extreme 4x4. We got the Poison Spider put to bed for a while and we're going to get back to work on our cheap Jeep and the ultimate Jeep, the AJ. We're going to be taking them both out on the trail next week, but we got to finish up a few things first. Now, as you know, heat is the number one killer for transmissions. You start burning your clutch discs, your drums weld themselves together, and then you can't go anywhere. So we had B&M send us their new high-tech cooling system. It comes with a unique plate and fin design, and it's got a built-in electric fan. So with this and our Autometer Trans Temp Gauge, we should have no worries. With the stock tranny line fitting removed, we can replace them with quarter inch NPT to dash six AN fittings we got from Earl's. Then we'll run dash six line from the transmission to the sensor block and onto the cooler. The cheap Jeep needs one more thing before it's ready for the trail, and that's new drive shafts. When we finished the spring overlift, it left our stock drive shaft at an unquestionable installed height and certainly not ready for any hardcore off road. So that means new drive shafts but we're gonna make them ourselves and we're gonna make square drive shafts. Now I know what you're thinking, square drive shafts? What's up with that? Well, it's been done many times and they work well for true off-road vehicles, not for the street. We're gonna start with a piece of two inch, quarter inch wall tubing and insert into it a piece of inch and a half quarter inch wall tubing. That'll leave us with a telescoping shaft, but because it's square tubing, it acts just like a spline shaft. Now you could get a set of custom spline shafts made but you gotta remember, this thing's the cheap Jeep, so it's done on the cheap. Another item that needs to be addressed is that by having a 383 Chevy small block and an aluminum radiator, we're gonna need to have some custom hoses. So we went to Earl's to get these Formaflex hoses and they come with these billet aluminum connector sleeves with silicone rubber on the inside. Put them on, cut the hose to fit, and put in some coolant. A good trail truck needs a good CO2 bottle, like this one that we got from Source One. We can fill this with high pressure CO2 and then dispense it through this liquid filled adjustable regulator to run air tools or fill our tires on the trail after we air them down. We'll just bolt this one to the cage with the supplied mounting bracket and it'll be good to go. One thing we built for this Jeep was a manifold to run our ARB air lockers. We have two solenoids, one for the front, one for the rear, and we'll just plug it into the bottle. I added a little tag so we know to keep the bottle under 90 PSI when it's plugged in. And now that these two are pretty much done, make sure you stay with us next week because we're taking these two out, AJ and CJ, head to head. On the trail. Road trip. <laughs>